Lord, I thank you for your blessings, God, and I thank you for this opportunity to come and, and fellowship with fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. I pray, Lord, a blessing over uh, Scott's teaching, that your word would go out, your spirit would speak, and then our hearts would be open and obedient to hear, Lord. And uh, may you be glorified in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. on here. Well, praise the Lord. If any of you need a Bible, uh, Brother Corey is going to give you a Bible. And make sure, raise your hand, and he's going to give you the sword. So we want to have that as we go through uh, the teaching this morning. And uh, a lot to cover, but a lot of good stuff. So I want to make sure everybody has a, has a Bible. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Um, let us pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. You are worthy to be praised, Lord Jesus, and we come before you, and we want to honor you because you are worthy. And we pray, Lord, as we get into the book of Revelation, that you would open up our ears and our eyes to give us truth and understanding of the interpretation of your holy word. We thank you for this day, and we want to let our light shine in this dark world because the world is getting darker and darker, but yet our hope is getting brighter and brighter. So help us to run this race. Help us to run it well. There is doors of opportunity all around us, and help us to go into those doors of opportunity. And so we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, praise God. You know, um, People get kind of wigged out in Revelation. They think, oh man, I can't understand that. But you know, I believe that God's word is meant to be understood. And I just want to give you a little brief um, transition before we get into it. The steps of Revelation. It originates with God. It is given to Jesus Christ. He gave it to his angel. His angel gave it to John. And from there it goes to his servants. That's you and me. And eschatology, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. Sometimes we kind of get it mixed up a little bit. But the rapture is going to take place first. The tribulation will follow unrestrained evil. And the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to come to judge the world. The millennium is to rule the world. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And that's what we're doing. What do we do in the meantime? We occupy till he comes, don't we? We be about our father's business. So let's get into it. Now this is the third section of the book of John who was transported to heaven. And here by the spirit, John, beloved, he's on the island of Patmos, into the spirit, into the presence of God. And God shows him from chapters, Revelation, chapters six through 19, what's gonna happen in the last seven years of world history. And yet, once we're here in chapter four, we have been given a revelation about the future, the last seven years of tribulation. From chapter six through 18, and chapter 19 is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then the millennium. Chapter 21 and 22, the eternal state of the church, believers in Christ. You know, it's interesting, Ezekiel 36 and 37, you know, it's already been fulfilled. You know, the, the Jews are in, back in their land. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is yet to be fulfilled. It's when the forces of the northern kingdom, Russia and all the armies that are coming together, the Muslim nations coming from Russia, all over the United States, South America, Europe, London, and yet, people don't get it. They are trying to take over the world. Did you know this, that if you look at Islam, it is not a Christian denomination by no means. 1.7 billion strong of Muslims. That's one third of the population. And let me just give you a little fact check on it. The Muslims deny that Jesus Christ is God. 
And Jesus said in John 8, 24, if you don't believe that I am he, you're going to die in your sins. They deny that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. The Bible says, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain. We are of most miserable men. We are still in our sins. They deny that he died on the cross. They deny that he rose again. And they say that Jesus is not the way. They say that Jesus pointed the way to Muhammad. Well, you know, John 14, 6, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. Did you know that many people believe that Islam, Judaism, Christianity are just kissing cousins? Did you know this? That the Quran, you cannot find one word on love in the Quran. It's all about hate. The Islamic invasion. Now, you know, there's probably good, some peaceful, loving Muslims. But I can tell you this. There's a lot of indoctrination going on. They can turn in a dime. The Islamic invasion is happening. It's taken over the world. And looking at Revelations chapter 4 and 5, John enters into the presence of God, which speaks about the rapture of the church. When he enters into heaven, of the rapture of the church, the first thing he's going to see when you die, when I die, the throne of God. Imagine that, the throne of God. The cherubims, the seraphims, and all the saints from the past to the present, they're going to be there. And you know, you know you've, had, you have had, you have had loved ones, you know, that they're Christians, right? And they're on the point of death. We don't... They are just ebbing on life, and they're going to die. You're a Christian, they're a Christian. And you know what? You never have to say goodbye. You say, I'm going to see you later. Because there's going to be a, a reunion with our loved ones, and that's going to be an incredible thing. We're going to see them again. Did you know this, that this is the generation that, that will not die, may not die? The rapture can take place. We may not die. There's going to be a rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 16 and 17. It says, The dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. What a hope, what a future. The rapture is imminent. It's going to come sooner than later. They're not going to find the word rapture in the Bible or in the New Testament, but the word is caught up, it's harpazo in the Greek. And in the Greek, it's to be snatched faster than a twinkling of an eye. That's pretty quick, you know? I mean, a, you blink an eye, and it's, it's gonna be a millisecond. It's gonna be quick. And you know what's, imagine this, the seven last years of history. People have sat in churches, they've heard the message, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Friday night, the Bible studies. And find some day, you come to church, and you find out through the radio, through the computer, cell phone, hundreds of millions of people are gone. Where do they go? Where do they go? And then you're going to have CNN come on, <laughs> right? The propaganda news channel, let's call it for what it is, along with their sister station, MSNBC, and they're going to say, you know what? They came down, the aliens came down, they, they swooped them away, and they're gone. That's going to be the narrative. Lies, 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 right? The Bible says there will be a generation that will not die, never die. We could be that generation. You know, there's going to be a rapture. You know, there's going to be scoffers and mockers. You know, I think of, uh, what is it, Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 4, it says that in the last days there'll be scoffers and mockers saying, where is the promise of his coming since the fathers died? All things continue as they have been. So there's going to be scoffers, there's going to be mockers. But you know what? It's going to happen. When God's word says it, it's going to happen. There's going to be a rapture. 
the first coming, Jesus came as a lamb, didn't he? John says, behold, I see Jesus coming, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But in the second coming, he's going to come as a judge, as a judge. And you know what? There's things to follow. We have the warm Armageddon that's going to take place. All nations are gathered. Listen, all nations are gathered together, and the blood is going to be five feet high. I'm not a big guy. I'm 5'7", maybe pushing probably 5'6". But it's probably got right here, the blood, the height of the blood. It's going to be 180 to 200 miles long of blood. What a bloodbath. Incredible. The Bible says that the east, the king of the east will come, China, with 200 million men army. And, you know, I looked it up today. They have 1.4 billion people. And so, you know, it's very plausible. You know, they have the numbers. They have the numbers. The Bible is true. People are sleeping. Are you listening? Be ready. Don't get left behind. You don't want to be here in the last years, seven years of world history. The prophetic events are going to happen. God has a prophetic program. The Antichrist will make his appearance. No more presidents, no more queens, no more kings. And you know what? He's going to take control of the nations. And you know really what it boils down to? It really boils down to this. The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and deceitfulness of riches. It boils down to that, doesn't it? That's what's going to drive him. And that's what drives people today. And let me just say this. He said he has a one world army, a one world banking system. And you know, look at the system today, the money system. You know, I mean, we are getting really close to the cash of society, aren't we? It's on steroids. And we're really getting there. We're going to be there pretty soon. You won't be able to buy, you won't be able to sell. The mark in the back of your right hand or head, the technology, is, the technology is there. And you know what? It's happening right before our eyes. Did you know that the Japanese have already developed a little microchip and it takes all your information? And you know what? It's coming, it's there, it's here. I look at AI, artificial intelligence, I think it's going to be used to draw you away from Jesus Christ. Be careful. Something's behind that. I think of Proverbs 14, 12, it says, There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end there is, is the way of death. Is the way of death. You know, you look at the White House. You look at the judges, the lawyers, the lawlessness, anarchy in the streets, the prisons. There's no fear. There's no fear of God. That's the world we live into that we have today. No fear of God. God is giving all the warnings. All the warnings. And there is a growing apostasy that the Bible talks about. Right? And you know, you look at the church. You look at what's going on today. I think of the Apostle Paul. You know, in Galatians chapter 1. It talks about another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. But in Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9, Paul says this. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But there would be some that would trouble you and revert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. He doubles down. As I said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. And so we have, we have deception today like never before. Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism. We have deception going on today, don't we? Like never before. We have a form of godliness, but we are denying the power thereof. I look at COVID. Boy, look at COVID. I'm telling you what, 
they tried like heck to shut the church down, didn't they? You know, I look at Hebrews 10.25, it says that we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And you know, they shut the church for two years, they clamped the church down. You can have the pot houses open, the abortion clinics open, the liquor store is open, but you can't have the church open. Satan was, is behind getting people away from the church, away from the body. And there was a lot of control there. There was an antichrist spirit behind there, preventing the church to get together. And you know the apostasy, what's really sad, is that many of those people that came to church are not coming to church again. They're not coming when they once came. There's a, there's a falling away big time. I think of uh, 1 Timothy 4.1. It says, Now the Spirit speaks expressively that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, not giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And I can tell you this, we have a lot of doctrines and demons going on, don't we? I mean, look at our society, look at our culture. Look at what they're doing to the kids. They're mutilizing, mutilating their bodies. And they're pushing this, they're pushing this. And you know, it's demonic. It is demonic. We need to pray for our younger generation. It's an under attack. Satan is behind that. And we need to stand up and be the light and speak out against it when it's not popular. You're gonna get hit, you're gonna be attacked, you're gonna be marginalized. They're gonna say you're not loving, but you know, we need to stand up for truth. And you know, I wanna stand on the side of truth because Jesus is the truth. And we need to stand up for it. Let me say this, Jesus talks about two roads. In Matthew chapter seven, verse 13 to 14, he talks about two roads. He says, straight is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go to that broad road. But Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And how many find it? Few. More people are going to hell than heaven. Jesus talked more about hell than any person in the Bible. But those people that went to hell, they don't have to go to hell. Because the whosoever, right? Whosoever will, then will come and take of the water of life freely. Whosoever. That's good news. Only a remnant's going to be saved. Only a remnant will go up in the rapture. So that's a little backdrop. Now let's, transit, let's get into the scriptures. Revelation 4, chapter 1. Excuse me, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read it. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. I will show you which must take place after this. And so the word after these things takes us back to Revelations 1, verse 19. Let's go to, back into, let's go to Revelations 1, 19. And let's look at the prophetic program here. Revelations 1, 19. And here's what it says. It says, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. After this. Metatata. There's three sections in John and three sections here. In chapter four, let's go back to chapter four. And the Greek word after this is metatalta, after these things. And quite obviously, you know, if you look at chapter two and three, it's talking about the seven churches, right? And, you know, it's finished its ministry, and now in chapter, Revelations chapter four through 19, He's going to speak of the seven year of Daniel, okay, the, uh, the second coming of Christ. And let's go, to, let's go to Daniel chapter 9 if we would. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And let's check that out. Keep your marker in chapter 4. So Daniel 9 27. 
This is talking about the Antichrist will come. Daniel 9, verse 27. Let's read that together. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end. In the middle of the week, let me just get back up here. It says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's seven years, okay? But in the middle of the week, which is three and a half years, he shall bring an end, sacrifice, offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolation, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolation. Talking about the Antichrist. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 4. The Antichrist will come. You know, I believe he's alive today. But you know, he can't make his appearance say, hi, you know, I'm the Antichrist, right? You know, here I am, you know, I'm the Antichrist. Until the church is taken out of the way. The restraining force, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read about this more in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, but for the sake of time, we don't have time to get in that, but you can, you can read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, once when the Spirit of God is taken out of the church, then what? The Holy Spirit now is not here. What's going to happen? The Antichrist spirit. Now finally, we're going to get conviction. In the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus came, died on the cross, shed his blood. He rose again. And on the day of Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's been here for 1,900 years. And you know, that's how you and I came to Christ, to the Holy Spirit. You know, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? It's to convict of sin, a judgment, and righteousness. And then we respond by faith, we repent, and receive Jesus. So if it wasn't more for the work of the Holy Spirit, none of us would be saved. The work of the Holy Spirit has an incredible role. You know, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. It's such a blessing. You know, you just need two people, right? Um, and you got, you got two or three, and Jesus is in the midst. It's incredible. And I'll tell you what, we need each other in these times that we're in. I thank God for these home Bible study groups because it's a very sweet time because the attack is going to be relentless. They're going to do all they can. You know, they, they use COVID, and let me tell you something. They're going to try to use something right around the corner. They're going to do all they can to prevent you from coming to assembling in the body of Christ. And so we need each other. We need each other big time. Amen. Let's continue on. Verse 1. Let's take it down to verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So in verse 2, one who sat on the throne, that is God. And you know, when we first get there again, we're going to see the throne of God, as I mentioned earlier. Amazing. In verses 1 and 2, you see here in verses 1 and 2 in chapter 4, you see John receives a vision for the future, not for the present. For he is on the island of Patmos. And you know, he's 90 years old. John is 90 years old. And I got to thinking, you know what? Man, you never retire from the ministry. 90 years old, and he's still going. I'll tell you what, when you retire is when the last breath in your body is extinguished. And then you graduate and you go home. So our ministry is never over if there's breath in our body. Amen. 90 years old. God takes him to heaven to show him a vision, a door, an open door, an entrance into heaven. It's kind of like the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul, you know, we only got, you know, I wish I had two hours, but, you know, that's, you're probably going to get hungry and, you know, your stomach's kind of, kind of churned, so I've got to kind of condense it down about an hour and ten. But I'll say this, the Apostle Paul, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you know, he says, I went back and I can't even explain the things that I heard and saw. God gave him incredible things that were happening and, and when he went into the third heaven, right? I mean, heaven's an incredible place. Sometimes you just can't even put an adjective on it. 
You can't even describe it. It's so spectacular. It's so marvelous. But I tell you what, you know, the Apostle Paul, you know, God loved him, and, but he gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble, to keep him humble. And so you know what? It's going to be an awesome place. We're going to receive the full knowledge. We're not going to be lacking anything at all. The Bible says that we shall be like him and we shall know him. We shall be like him. We shall know each other as he is known. And he's going to give us body as it pleases him. I don't know what kind of body that's going to be, but you know what? It's going to be okay because you're going to get an upgrade. These bodies are breaking down. You know, you wake up every morning and you get a little weaker. Your vision gets a little more blurrier. Your ears get a little more duller. But you know what? We got a great place to go to. And some people ask me, you know, is there going to be any pets in heaven? You know, <laughs> I'll say yes. I'll say yes, you know? I'll, I'll tell you what, it's not, a, it's not a salvation issue, is it? It's a discussion. But there's going to be nice pets, not mean pets. <laughs> Amen. You know, heaven's an incredible place, you know, and <laughs> in Revelation 21.4, it says this, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, for the former things have passed. They're in the rearview mirror. And I can tell you right now, there's a lot of crying, there's a lot of tears, there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of death right now. But in heaven, no more. We got a great future. But you know, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Not perfect people, but forgiven people. Amen. But on the flip side, as we talked about what Jesus said in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, there's, there's the broad road, destruction, there's a narrow road. And you know, hell is a horrible place. You know, people like to talk about heaven a lot, and that's a good thing. But you know, don't, live, don't leave the flip side over. Don't leave out hell. It's a horrible place. And when you go there, you're not, you're not going to get out of it. In Hebrews 9.27, it says, It's appointed a man that wants to die, and after this, the judgment. You know, you don't do your little purgatory, you know, and get your uh, masses and get out of hell. No. Let's go to Revelation 14.11, uh, and let's look at this. Revelation 14.11. By the way, there is no purgatory. Okay, that's the big, biggest money maker that the Catholic Church has ever produced, purgatory. So, Revelations 14, 11. It says this. In the smoke of their torment, it stands up for how long? Forever, Forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast in his image. Whosoever receives the mark of his name. And so it, it's, it's, it's a horrible place. Jesus did all he could to prevent you from going there. Now let's go back to Revelations 4. Revelations 4 if we would. There's three doors mentioned in the book of Revelation. And it's, one is it's here right in, in the first verse of chapter 4. And we're going to go next door to the left and talk about the Church of Philadelphia as an open door. But I see the open door in, for today for evangelism. I see it for today for evangelism. You know, people say, gosh, you know, you know you're always talking about evangelism and this and that. But you know what? Let me tell you something. Isn't that what, isn't that what it's all about? Getting people to heaven? How could you ever get tired of that? You know, I mean... <laughs> It's an open door to win the lost. Jesus says, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. I see an open door for evangelism. You know, and that open door could be at work. I'm telling you, there's incredible things. You know, many of you work, and you know, you have an open door of opportunity at your job to speak to your coworker, to speak to the secretary, or anyone at your job. Incredible opportunity. It could be at school, your schoolmates. And you know, the open door, it could be at your grocery store. It could be at Walmart, right? Marilyn, Walmart. 
Amen. Could be at Home Depot, you know? You're going to go pick up some things for the plumbing. You know, the plumbing broke down, and next thing you know, you're asking where this is at, and you get in the conversation, and, you know, always look for an open door of opportunity to share to that person about Jesus Christ. He may be the only person you're going to hear. It may be his last moment on earth, and you're the last person to talk to him. A church of opportunity. Could be at the gym, pumping iron. Could be at the beach. It could be riding your bicycle. It could be knocking on doors. It could be going to the park. You know, but let me just say this about what I just said. Does your life match your talk? Everything in public, God sees everything in public and private, doesn't he? Do you have two standards? One standard do you have when you go to church, and the other standard is when you're at home. People are looking, people are listening. Don't cause people to stumble. You have to earn your right to speak, don't you? You really do. May the standard be just as good as here in church and just as it is at home. Amen. Let's look at another door. Well, you know, I, I think of missions, right? Um, incredible. You know, Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. How about the persecuted church? We got to support our brothers and sisters that are in Islamic countries that are dying by the masses for their faith. We need to pray for the persecuted church. You know, um, they would, they're not here in a nice, you know, warm seat with a Bible, glass of water. They are living on the line of life and death every single day. Let us not forget about our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. Amen. And you know what? You have an opportunity. You know, on Sunday morning, not Sunday evening, um, the last Sunday of the month, we can come in the sanctuary and we can pray together corporately as a body for our church, the persecuted church, for our government, for our schools, for our neighborhoods, our communities. We have an opportunity to pray for that, so let's, let's, let's get behind that. The Great Commission, Acts 1.8. You know, it, 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 Acts 1.8 is incredible. And, and really it says, in Acts 1.8, it says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem, and the uttermost parts of the ends of the earth. That power from the Holy Spirit. I need that power every day. I can't do it. You can't do it. But through God, we can do all things. All things are possible, right? Amen. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. Now, Let's go to um, Revelation 3, and let's take it to verse 8. This is the church of Philadelphia. There's an open door here. Revelation 3, 8. And here's what it says. I know your works. I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. Now look at this. Look at this. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Amen. What a beautiful thing. That's where I want to be. That's where we want to be here at Calvary Chapel Saving Grace. We want to be the, the church of Philadelphia, don't we? Amen. Did not deny his name and kept his word. Now there's another open door. How about Revelation 3.20? Jesus says, I go to the door. It says, I go to the door and stand and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and I will dine with him. The open door, that's a door of opportunity. And you know what? I look at creation. It's amazing. If you look at creation, the whole counsel of God's word, there's an open door of revelation of God's creation. I mean, look at the sun, the moon, the stars. You go out at nighttime, there's no light reflections, and you look up at the sky, and you see millions and billions of stars you see Arturus, you see Orion, you see Pleiades. I mean, these are star constellations that are amazing. There's billions of stars. And you know what? <laughs> In Psalm 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, 
and the earth show its, its handiwork. It's God's preachers in the sky that's preaching that I'm the creator that made this creation. And you know what? In Psalm 147, verse 4, it says, He numbers them by count, and he calls them all by name. Individual stars. There's billions of stars. That's amazing. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, you think your problem is too big for God to solve? If he knows every star, he knows every name of every star, I think he knows your name, and I think he knows what you're going through, and I think, you know what, he cares. He cares big time. You know, it's a beautiful thing, and sometimes we think we're all alone. We hit the wall, nobody cares. You know, God's not here, and God doesn't care. He does care. He does care. It says, with God, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. To me, that's, that's very hopeful, you know? Praise the Lord. Let's go to verse 2, boy. Okay, let's, let's go back. Let's go to uh, verse 2 in, in Revelation 4, and let's break it down. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one who sat on the throne. So immediately, the Spirit of God took him up. The first thing he says, as I mentioned, is the throne of God. The cherubims and seraphims, and all the people from the past, all the old saints are there. Everyone that has died are there. Everyone are there. Verse, verse 3. Verse 3. And he who sat there was like a jasper, a sardis stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Amazing, spectacular. God's perfection and beauty. He's sitting on the throne. And God describes the most precious jewels, the brilliance, his beauty, the beauty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in all his splendor. The continents of the most holy, like a jasper stone. Incredible, the light reflections that you can even imagine. And you know what? It represents perfection, the purity of God Almighty, and he is perfect. The Sardis stone was the fiery red stone, and it represented the justice of God. And yet, these stones was the first and last precious stones in the breastplate of the priests. The 12 stones, the 12 tribes of Israel, and the emerald is green, and the rainbow that surrounds the throne the throne looked like emerald green, so beautiful. And it represents the mercy of God in the new covenant, of God's grace to each one of us individually. Let's take it down to verse 4. Around the throne there were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And you don't notice the white robe, the white robe of righteousness. Right? It seems like everything in heaven is white, but the white robe of righteousness. And they had crowns, crowns of gold on their heads. So what's going on here in, 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 in chapter, excuse me, in, in verse 4? Did you notice in that verse that the 24 elders were sitting? That shows they're near to the heart of God. Being in honor with his presence not their presence, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Remember Mary? Mary and the others who became, as she washed the feet of Jesus with her hair, and the disciples became upset, didn't they? You know? Jesus said, this woman has done more than any of you because she humbled herself. The 24 elders were the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New Testament, okay? A lot of commentary on that. I kind of fall on that, and I believe that to be true. The 24 elders in this vision are represented of all the redeemed of God from all, of all time, both before and after Christ's death and resurrection. Those elders symbolize all things, both to the Jew and Gentile, 
who are part, now part of God's family. The 24 elders shows us all the redeemed of the Lord, the saints are promised crowns, and he rewards them in heaven with the holy priesthood. You know, we belong to a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We have been transformed from God's marvelous, from the darkness to the light. We are God's people. Let's go to 1 Peter, and let's look at chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9, and look at what we have in Christ. It's amazing. A little bit to the left. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. Wow, look at this. It says this about the redeemed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who what? Calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once lost, now I'm found. I was once a sinner, and now I'm a saint. From darkness to God's marvelous light. Now, let's look at Revelation 1, 6. Look at, our, look at this, Revelation 1, 6. <clears throat> Revelation 1, 6 says this. And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for how long? Forever and ever. Ever and ever. Wow. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony. You know, when I think this, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I think of Isaiah 118. Isaiah 118. Let's go to Isaiah 118. Isaiah 118, let's turn it there. And here's what it says. Isaiah 118, but they that, it's talking about salvation. Let me get to it, I'm sorry. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? You know, that's really talking about salvation. Come now, let us reason together. Now, let's go back to Revelation chapter 4, and let's read verses 5 and 6 as we continue on with this, with this incredible chapter. Verses 5 and 6. And here's what it says. And from the throne proceeds lightnings and thunders. There's a lot going on on the throne. And voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. In the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. So they were living creatures full of eyes in front and back. They could see everywhere. There were, they could see peripheral vision, the front, the back, the sideways, all around. And I was thinking about God. <laughs> I was thinking about what, what the word says in Hebrews 4.13, the latter part of Hebrews 4.13. It says, all things are naked and open with him whom we have to do. God sees everything. His angel sees everything. God's on the throne. Nothing goes unnoticed with God. He sees everything of what's going on. And think about, he's saying here, he says, that he presents the seraphims. And you see three things that are added here into the throne of God. Notice of all the lightnings and the thunderings that's going on. And the, ma the, majestic of, uh, the majesty of his awesome voice of God speaking out he who has an ear to hear let him hear 
what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. Amen. We continue in verses 5 and 6. The sea of glass. It's stretching out before the throne. And the sea of glass symbolizes the impressiveness of God's presence before us. God's presence before us. Now let me just say this. Have you ever felt the presence of God? I know you're shaking your heads. I have too. It's amazing. The presence of God. You know, you're driving your car. And, you know, you're driving. You're going wherever you're going. And you know what? Somebody comes into your, to your mind a thought. God brings somebody into your thought. And, you know, he's saying, pray for that person. They're, they're going through a hard time. And, you know, the presence of God shows up. And you know what? You intercede for that person. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a stranger. Or maybe it's a circumstance. The presence of God. Or you're going to bed. You turn the lights out. You're sleeping. You're closing your eyes. And you know God speaks to you. You feel the presence of God coming upon you. Of what it is. Maybe it's a circumstance, a situation, a person, a family member, somebody that's going through a, a very difficult a physical challenge and God shows up and you feel his presence, his compassion and he's telling us to pray for them. God is so personal. You know, he is so personal and he cares about his creation. He cares about you and God shows up. Sometimes you feel the presence of God, you're just crying, you're weeping. You know, whatever it is, you have something that's heavy on your heart and you feel God just, you know, rushing in like a mighty wind and he shows up and you feel his presence and you're close to God. You've come into the throne room of God. I think it's Psalm 91, it says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. I get into the refuge and the fortress of God. I feel the presence of God and he shows up. You know, as people of God, we want to spend time with God. And we want to be sensitive to God. And you know, he's personal. He shows up. I'm so thankful for that. Amen. Let's take it over seven and nine. The first living creature was a lion, like a lion. The second living creature, like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. They do not rest day or night saying what? Here it is. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. The eternal presence of God. The past, the present, and the future. Amazing. Amazing. Verse 9. Whoever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. So in the book of Ezekiel, the four are the four gospels. Matthew represented the lion, the king. Mark, the calf, the servant. Luke, and man, the son of man. And John, the eagle, the son of God. Imagine these angels, as we read these verses, imagine these angels in the throne room of God. The living creatures can also be re represented by his power and by his majesty. The calf endures mass intelligence. The, ca the eagle speed and executes a judgment. And the creature's position, notice the angels, they're by the throne of God, if you notice. And what are they doing? <coughs> They're the guardians of God's throne in his holy presence. Nobody can get close to that. They will be wiped out. The presence in the throne of God, look at the description. They are found, the throne of God, of Lord God Almighty. And you know, in 5 and 6, as we look at 5 and 6, it's the 777. Seven, seven. The 7 is the number of perfection. Okay, perfection. Amazing. You know, 
If you look at number one is unity, number two is where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Number three is trinity. Number four is the four corners of the earth. Number five is grace. Number six is imperfection. And number seven is per perfection. Number eight is new beginnings. Number 13 is Satan. 39 is mercy. 40 is judgment. Numerology in the kingdom of God. Interesting. Now let's go, let's look at verse 8. That verse 8. It's amazing to see these four living creatures. Each of them have six wings full of eyes. And how about their function? It's that they're, they're with the holiness, the holiness of God, but it's the wrath of God. It's the wrath of God. Let's go to Revelation 6.1. And let's look at Revelation 6.1. Let's look at a, a couple of verses here, okay? In Revelation 6.1, it says this. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with a voice of thunder, come and see. Come and see. Let's take it down to verse 8. And I looked behind a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Let's take it down to verse 7 in chapter 6. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I look and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was what? Death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. Let's go to Revelation 15, 7, if we would. So we're having judgment being poured out, aren't we? Revelation 15, 7. The tribulation period. Revelation 15, 7 says this. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Let me tell you something. The tribulation period is going to be a horrible, horrible period. God has saved it. God has spared it before the end. And we are that generation. The people that stay behind are going to get totally scared. Totally scared. The problem is, if they receive the mark of the beast in their hand or their forehead, they can never go to heaven. Never go to heaven. They're done. They're, they're going to hell. You don't want to take the mark. The Bible says don't take the mark. If you do, there's no hope. But God has warned us. Christians in the last seven years of world history, the only way they can get to heaven is to be beheaded. But if you don't take the mark and you go on to the... <clears throat> And you, and you get to survive and you go on your own. And there will be people on the second coming of Christ. Listen, people that were here for the seven years, they never took the mark of the beast, and they will get to go into the kingdom age. Okay? Their children, their wives, they'll repopulate the earth for a thousand years. That's going to take place. But did you notice in Revelation? Let's go to Revelation 4 8. Let's go back to Revelation 4 8. If you notice, the angel is crying, holy, 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 day and night, Lord God Almighty, declaring the holiness of God. And in verse 9, in verse 9 as we read, notice that the function, they glorify, they honor God all night long, all night long. And did you know this? 56 times in Scripture it describes that God is almighty. 56 times. How can people miss it? You know, I, I don't, they say, I don't see where Jesus is God in the scriptures. It's all the way through the Bible. Genesis or Revelations, it's all there. You know, it's because your heart is hard. You know, until God gets a hold of your heart, you know, and I, the natural man cannot receive the, the things of the spirit, right? For they are spiritually discerned. And so it's a spiritual battle. We got to pray. For the hearts, the eyes be open, and the heart gets soft. 
God is speaking. And God is saying, I want to be part of your life. I want to have a, a relationship with you. I want to come into your life. Now let's take it, let's take it to these na- last two verses. Let's take it down to uh, verse 10 if we would. And let's, let's read verse 10. And it says this. Chapter 4, verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships and worships him. Whoever lives and worships him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crown before the throne. Now, verse 11 it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. Now, it says that in the King James, they are and were created. I kind of like that. Um, it says it a little differently in your new king, but it, it's really one of the same, okay? God has created everything, okay? And notice this. You know, that does away with evolution, doesn't it? Because God has created everything, but what is the culture doing? They're telling you that you're the product of evolution. You look at Genesis, and everything is after its own kind. Everything. The fossil record indicates that. There's no transitional form of fossil records. Everything is after its own kind. We didn't come from some, you know, inorganic soup bubbling away and then we became to be a man or a woman. That's, that's hogwash, right? Biogenesis is this. Life only arises from life, not non-living matter, okay? So God created everything. You know, in, in John 1, 3, it says all things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made. He made everything. Colossians 1, 16 for by him all things are created in heaven and in earth, thrones, dominions, principalities and powers. All things were created by him and for him, and before him all things consist. So God is the creator. And the reason why they don't want you to believe that, because they want to strip God out of the equation. They love their sin way too much, and they don't want to be accountable for their sin. God is the creator, a maker of heaven and earth. And I'm going to close with this last scripture here. It's in Nehemiah 9.6. Nehemiah 9.6. And if you have trouble finding it, it's right after 2 Chronicles. Okay? Nehemiah 9.6. And I love this verse. It's very powerful. Nehemiah 9.6. God is the creator. And here's what it says. I'll wait till we're all there. Nehemiah 9, 6. Here's what it says. I love to hear those pages turning, and they're turning, and take your time. We're not going anywhere. We're going to settle in on the Word of God. Amen. Nehemiah 9, 6. Here it is. You alone are the Lord, and you have made what? Heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all your host. The earth and everything that's in it, the seas and all that's in it. And you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Wow. God is the creator of the heavens and the heavens. And all the host is worshiping the almighty God. And you know what? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And things in heaven and earth and under the earth. That the name of Jesus... Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen? Now let me say this. What did we learn? We learned this. The rapture can take place any moment. In a twinkling of an eye, are you ready? How many more signs do you need? You look at, the, look at what we just talked about in this chapter. The money system, the banking system, the Antichrist, the things that are going on in the world, how Satan is trying to you know, suppress the church. The mark. Look at all these things. How many more signs do you need? You know, God is coming, and he wants to come for a church, his people. He wants to come, and he wants you to receive him as Lord and Savior. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. No man is guaranteed for tomorrow, for no man knows when tomorrow comes. It's today. We never know when this last breath is going to be breathed out of our lungs. Because when it does, then you're either in the presence of God or you're in hell. 
There's no in between, guys. There's no second chance after death. The urgency of receiving Christ is today. Remember we talked about those doors as opportunity? What do we do in the meantime? We do what we're doing right now. We're growing in the wisdom and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We get filled, we get filled in the word of God and we go out to the highways and the byways, the work sites, the grocery stores, Walmart, Home Depot, and we get the word of God out. The gym, our neighbors, you know, maybe you don't know your neighbors too well. You know, as Pastor Don says, you know, go over and invite them for, come over for a cup of coffee. Get to know them, tell them who you are. And you could build a relationship up. So let's seize the moment, the opportunity, the times that we have. God loves us. And he's got a great plan for us. And when I look at heaven, why would you not want to go to heaven? Think about it. No more crying. No more tears. No more pain. No more death. No more suffering. Those things are past. On the flip side, hell. Torment. Forever and ever and ever. I mean, that's a pretty easy choice for me. But it's a heart condition. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. You know, I'm going to pray. If any of you, you know, you heard this message, and you know, you're not sure where you are. You know, you're not sure if you're going to go up in the rapture. I'll tell you what. I don't want to live in a question mark. I'm going to know where I'm going to go when I die. Okay? So if you don't know and you, you're not sure, come on up. We'll pray for you. Or maybe, you know, you walked strong with the Lord and you ran the race well and you got sidelined. The enemy's kind of, you know, kind of come against you and, and you kind of went to a different path and you got kind of caught up in sin. And you feel that you can't get back. No, that's a lie. Come on back and rededicate your life to the Lord and come and there's restoration. There's, there's, a new, there's a new life that God wants to infuse into you. He wants to get you back in the race. So if you're backslidden, you want to make a rededication, come on up. And you know, maybe it's anything. All the above, a marriage, finances, health issues. Come on up, we'll pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this, this morning. Your word is new, it's fresh, it's alive. And your Lord, Lord, your word doesn't change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, you care about us. You number the stars and you give us a name. I thank you that you care about us. And so I pray that you continue to bless us. Help us to occupy till you come. Be about our Father's business. We don't want to slumber or sleep. We want to be about the work of the kingdom because we know that the time is nearing end and we want to run this race and we want to run it well. We want to press on to the mark of the high prize and calling of Jesus Christ. And we love you, Jesus, for you are worthy of all honor and all glory and all praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen.